Welcome to Music History Monday for June 10th, 2024. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Let Us Quaff from the Cup, Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. On June 10th, 1865, 159 years ago today, Richard Wagner's magnificent and groundbreaking music drama, Tristan und Isolde, received its premiere in Munich under the baton of Hans von Bülow, whose wife, Cosima Liszt von Bülow, Wagner was enthusiastically stupping at the same time. Oh goodness, did I just say that? I did. I know, right? Here I am introducing Tristan und Isolde, one of the most awesome, incredible works of art ever created and I still couldn't resist a cheap dig at Wagner the person. As we have discussed in the past, and will do so again, the same personality flaws that made Richard Wagner an often despicable narcissist allowed him the conceit to reject the operatic cliches and conventions of his time and to create a body of dramatic musical art unfathomable in its originality, beauty, dramatic power, and imagination. Of course, had he not been the towering genius he was, and had he not risked everything, including his sanity, over and over again to create his unparalleled body of work, well, he would just have been another loathsome crank writing nasty letters to newspaper editors and shouting at people in the street. But he was a towering genius, and he did create a singularly stunning body of work, a body of work we all deserve to revel in. So revel we shall, with the satisfying understanding that our pleasure in Wagner's music affords him no monetary profit or emotional gratification at all, because he's been dead since February 13th, 1883. Our Game Plan This post will indeed discuss Tristan und Isolde, its basic storyline and its origins. But this post will deal primarily with the cliché but inescapable Wagner problem. How to reconcile Wagner the man with Wagner the artist and how to allow ourselves to accept the man while reveling in the artist. Meanwhile, my Dr. Bob prescribes posts for June 11 and 18 will feature my favorite DVD recording of Tristan und Isolde, and as such, will be all about Tristan und Isolde all the time. Don't call it an opera. Tristan und Isolde is a three-act music drama, or what Wagner himself called eine Handlung, which means a drama or an action. By his mid-career, Wagner outright refused to use the word opera, except as a pejorative, claiming that the word represented the debased musical stage works of everyone not named Richard Wagner. Tristan und Isolde's libretto, or poem, as Wagner would have us call it, was written and its music composed by Wagner between 1855 and 1859. Wagner based his poem on a 12th century romance entitled Tristan by Gottfried von Strasberg, 
who died circa 1210. Wagner's poem tells the story of two presumed enemies, the Irish princess Isolde and the Cornish, that is, Southern English knight Tristan, who presumably fall madly in love only when they are duped into drinking a love potion. Many modern observers, yours truly included, believe that this love potion is in fact a placebo, likely of high alcohol content, Bacardi 151, for example, a drink that allows Tristan and Isolde to, like, finally get in touch with their feelings and admit that they've actually loved each other for years. Unfortunately, their love for each other is illicit. Isolde is due to marry the King of Cornwall, an old dude named Mark, and unconsummated. Yes, despite their very best efforts, T and I never managed to do the dirty, perhaps because they just can't stop singing about how much they love each other. In the end, Tristan is cut down by a fellow knight of Cornwall, and Isolde, on watching Tristan die, expires over his now dead body in an orgasmic haze. Critics of Tristan und Isolde have referred to Wagner's linked infatuation with sex and death as perfumed obscenity and its orgasmic and deathly conclusion as snuff opera. Those nattering nabobs of critical negativism aside, I will happily argue that Tristan und Isolde is Wagner's single greatest work. There's nothing else even remotely like it in the repertoire. The Cult One of the many things that turns people off about Wagner is the Wagner cult. Again, he was among the very greatest of composers. But for better or for worse, the magical beauty and dramatic power of Wagner's music combined with the breath taking grandiosity of his artistic vision, his embrace of the universality of myth conflated with German nationalism, his endless polemics, shameless sense of entitlement, and superinflated ego together inspired a Wagner cult, one that began in his lifetime and lives on to this day. There are Wagnerians out there, Wagnerites, Wagnerphiles, and, at its most extreme, Wagner paths, who will travel across the country to see a Wagner production, across continents and oceans to attend a ring cycle, who will at least once in their lifetimes make Hodge to the Wagnerian Mecca that is the Bavarian city of Bayreuth, Wagnerians whose knowledge of and opinions regarding Wagner performances, singers, and recordings can only be called encyclopedic. There is no other composer in the great history of Western music who has inspired such quasi-religious adulation as Richard Wagner. Like Shakespeare before him and J.R.R. Tolkien, George Lucas, and George R. R. Martin after him, Wagner created an alternative universe that is, for no small number of otherwise sane people, an indispensable part of their lives. And yet, for every reverential Wagner freak, there would appear to be an equally adamant Wagner phobe, someone who is disgusted by the Wagner cult and the man that inspired it by his arrogance his racial theories, and his belief in the inherent superiority of all things German. A telling Wagner quote. Quote, I am the most German of beings. I am the German spirit. Consider the incomparable magic of my works. Unquote. Mixed feelings. 
Consider the incomparable magic of my works. There we are, right back to the conceit and narcissism first broached at the top of this post. And yet Wagner is right. His works are incomparably magical. So why do Wagnerian statements, like the one just quoted, so turn us off? Hey, we didn't dislike Muhammad Ali when he told us that he was the greatest. In fact, we loved him for it. It was part of his shtick, part of his brand. So why do we hold statements like Wagner's against him? To my mind, it's because that in life he was such an unrepentant, megalomaniacal, malevolent jerk. It is an unfortunate fact that the more we get to know Richard Wagner, the person, the less we like him. Harold Schoenberg, for many years, the chief music critic for the New York Times, was blunt in his appraisal of Wagner, the man. Quote, as a human being, he was frightening, amoral, hedonistic, selfish, virulently racist, arrogant, filled with the gospels of the Superman, the Superman naturally being Wagner, and the superiority of the German race, he stands for all that is unpleasant in human character." Unquote. And yet, and yet this same Harold Schoenberg gushed over Tristan und Isolde, quote, never in the history of music had there been an operatic score of comparable breadth, intensity, harmonic richness, massive orchestration, sensuousness, power, imagination, and color. Tristan was to the second half of the 19th century what Beethoven's Eroica and Ninth Symphonies had been to the first half, a breakaway, a new concept. What Tristan does is to describe inner states with a kind of power and imagination that peels off layer after layer of the subconscious. It abounds in symbols, symbols of night, day, eroticism, the dream world, nirvana. Whatever its meaning or meanings, Tristan und Isolde brings together man and woman and probes their deepest impulses." Unquote. For most of us, like Harold Schoenberg, our attitude towards Wagner today can be summed up in two words mixed feelings. Wagner's artistic greatness cannot be questioned whether or not we like the subject matter or length of his works. Yet his megalomania, narcissism, racism, anti-Semitism, fanaticism, and other like isms admittedly make him the single most repellent composer in the long history of Western music. He believed that his artistic muse required the creature comforts of a Saudi prince and that his genius entitled him to anything he wanted. He was shamelessly upfront about it, declaring in 1864, quote, I am a different kind of organism. I have hypersensitive nerves. I must have beauty, splendor, and light. The world ought to give me what I need. I cannot live the wretched life of a town organist like Bach. Is it such a shocking demand if I believe that I am due the luxury I enjoy?" Unquote. Emma Herweg, the wife of Wagner's friend, the poet Jörg Herweg, had no patience for Wagner, who she wrote off as, quote, this pocket-sized edition of a man, this folio of vanity, heartlessness, and egoism." Unquote. Conversely, Heinrich Porges, a German-Jewish writer and choral conductor who worked with Wagner, understood Wagner. He wrote, quote, "...such demonic personalities cannot be judged by ordinary standards." They are egoists of the first order, and must be so, 
or they could never fulfill their mission. Unquote. Separating the man and the artist? Many knowledgeable observers would argue, among them the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844 to 1900, who knew Wagner personally, that Wagner the man and Wagner the artist should be considered as two completely separate entities. But in fact, we cannot separate Wagner the man from his music. According to Wagner himself, his life and work constitute a single, indivisible entity. His attitudes and beliefs, controversial, even loathsome though they might be, lie at the heart of his mature stage works. Even more, Wagner himself lies at the heart of every one of his mature stage works. Every single one of his major male characters, starting with the martyred, anti-aristocratic, populist hero Cola de Rienzi, the title character of his first major opera, Rienzi, of 1840, is a thinly and sometimes not so thinly veiled projection of Richard Wagner himself. In The Flying Dutchman of 1841, Wagner is the Dutchman, a tragic, lonely, supernatural character in search of redemption through love. In Tannhäuser of 1845, Wagner is Heinrich Tannhäuser, a medieval Orpheus struggling between the pleasures of the flesh and the spirit in search of redemption through love. In Lohengrin of 1848, Wagner is Lohengrin, a supernatural knight who has stepped into the world of mortals in search of a woman's love. Wagner is the revolutionary hero Siegfried in the Ring Cycle. He is the fearless, self-taught singer Walter von Stolzing in the Master Singers of Nuremberg. He is the world-redeeming, holy grail-finding knight Parsifal in Parsifal. Wagner as Tristan of Cornwall. Most of all, Wagner is Tristan of Cornwall, a loyal and honorable knight driven to near madness by the love for a woman he can never possess. Tristan und Isolde is Wagner's single most autobiographical work, and here's why. Because of his revolutionary activities in Dresden, Wagner had to skedaddle, hey, feet don't fail me now, out of Germany in 1849. Having gotten away, he and his wife Mina, 1809 to 1866, settled in Zurich, Switzerland. Wagner chose Zurich because it was the home of one of his principal patrons, a silk merchant and Wagner freak named Otto von Wessendonck, 1815 to 1896. Herr von Wessendonck's passion for Wagner's music was soon shared by his young and very beautiful wife, Matilda, 1828 to 1902, with whom Wagner, predictably, fell madly in love. Wagner's wife, Mina, intercepted a love letter from her husband to Matilda. Assuming, probably incorrectly, that Wagner and Matilda were sleeping together, she kicked Wagner out. All of this surus corresponds precisely with the writing of the poem and composition of Tristan und Isolde, which in hindsight can be seen for what it is, a diary of Wagner's own roller coaster emotions about loving the wife of his king, meaning his principal patron, Otto von Wessendonck, a woman he knew he could never possess. By the way, Wagner's Tristan und Isolde remains the best evidence that for all the gossip and all the innuendo, Wagner and Matilda's relationship was strictly platonic, non-physical. Wagner biographer Barry Millington asks the key question 
when he writes, quote, could that monumental expression of yearning that is Tristan und Isolde have been composed while its creator was in the throes of ecstasy? Wagner's love for Matilda indeed wrung from him some of the most passionate music he ever composed, but it is surely the effusion of one who is denied the ultimate satisfaction." Unquote. Can we separate Wagner the man from Wagner the artist? No, they are one and the same. We've got to embrace the whole controversial Wagnerian package because every part is essential to the whole and the whole includes one of the most compelling and worthwhile bodies of art ever created. With Richard Wagner, it's all or nothing. And for me, at least, nothing is not an option. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.